This is the Lean Construction Blogs Podcast, a podcast dedicated to stories, case studies, and lessons learned of applying lean construction from around the world. Join Dick Beyer as he interviews industry leaders, lean construction practitioners, and subject matter experts to help you improve the build environment in general and your design and construction projects in particular, advance your lean journey, and bring your continuous improvement efforts to the next level. Let's get started. Welcome everybody to the podcast. I'm Dick Beyer. And this is the LeanConstructionBlog.com podcast. Wherever you are, thanks for joining us today. We are joined by uh, one of the three or four most important guys, I think, in the entire lean community. Um, I'm so honored to call him a friend and a buddy and a, a mentor, uh, Will Lichtig. Welcome, Will. Thanks, Dick. It's always great to be together with you. <laughs> Too much fun. That's right. Um, so we're just going to kind of wander through, as, uh, as we said uh, our our plan today is to wander through where we go and end up where we get. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. Um, you and I share the fact that we were sons of lawyers. I don't know if your grandfather was a lawyer, but your father sounded like uh, my father was a divorce lawyer. <laughs> As was mine. Uh, which was always interesting in the house. You always felt like, you know, you're constantly on the uh, on the on the edge of being disowned or or assigned to some other family. Um, so your father was a divorce lawyer as well. That's cool. He was. And you grew up in Los Angeles. Grew up in grew up in L.A. proper. Yep. I was born and raised there, and and uh, spent my formative years until I graduated from high school in uh, Los Angeles basin. You bet. So which of the uh, many neighborhoods in Los Angeles? I always think of Los Angeles as like three hundred small communities that are knit together only by name. Yeah, so we I grew up in a community that it's sometimes called uh, the the Beverlywood community. It's it's really right adjacent to Century City. When I was a kid growing up, 20th Century Fox had just decided to sell off basically their back lots from the studio, which ultimately became the development called Century City in LA. And as that was continuing to develop, a lot of the place now where there are very expensive condominiums was open grass fields. We used to go up uh, up there and, and with our golf clubs and our golf balls and, and use it as a, a mini golf course for ourselves because That's there was so much open space up there. And for folks who have been back to the area now, they're, you know, the Century Towers are in there and then all those condominiums at the base. So it's a very different kind of look and feel than when I was growing up. Yeah, it was funny that, um, you know, I graduated from law school in uh, 1976 and had a job. And my first travel was to accompany somebody on a deposition to Century City. And that's where I found out that I'd passed the Colorado bar. So it's always been uh, deep in my heart, but it was pretty open then, back yes. in, in the 80s. Yes. So, and the 70s it was pretty open. So uh, you ended up going to the University of California at Santa Cruz, right? I did. So I, I graduated. Uh, from high school and decided to become a Southern California refugee. I uh, basically um, <laughs> I like decided that. to go up, go up north and go to UC Santa Cruz. At that time, Santa Cruz had been on the map maybe for eight or 10 years as a university. It, it had a very different approach to uh, educating undergraduates, which was really appealing to me. It was a lot of direct interaction with, with the professors. They were all very accessible. They viewed themselves first as educators of undergraduates, followed by uh, research and scholarship. So it was a great environment to actually be able to connect with, with uh, your professors and really hone the way you thought as well as the things you thought about. So it was great. Yeah, my son Henry spent uh, the first semester of his university career there. Um, and when I, rem I remember driving up there, I went to a very traditional New England college with, uh, you know, grassy lawns and big chapels and 250 year old buildings. And I got to Santa Cruz and it was like world headquarters of outward bound. And I said, well, this is really cool. It, it proved to be too much for Henry, the deer coming to the window and all the rest of that. He missed his La Jolla High fan friends. And so he moved on to Santa Barbara, but um, I always thought Santa Cruz was a, was a very cool place. 
So you majored in anthropology, I think you told me some years ago. It did. I think is really interesting given that, you know, you and I have spent the last several decades of our lives looking at culture and how culture works and how you influence culture. So what did you, what did you learn from, I've always been really interested in what you learned from anthropology that's affected how we tried to build culture on a team. Sure. So it was interesting because anthropology gave you a framework for understanding how groups work together. So, so starting from the smallest band of the family or the group of the family all the way up uh, to, to, uh, to clans and, and bands and all the different ways that you grew up. And, and you, you really came to understand that the informal networks are as important as the formal rules. Most traditional societies, they don't actually have, they have rules, but they often don't have those rules written down. And so it's really developing cultural norms and cultural mores. So cultural norms being sort of how you think about what is right and wrong and the, and the mores being more about what the, the uh, internal rules are. Um, and you have to figure out how to work within those structures, but at the same time, really focus on the individual. My, my uh, senior thesis for anthropology was actually on the anthropology of law. So that was sort of the bridge between mm. what I had focused on in college and, and where I moved on to going to law school. And, and the focus of the, of the thesis was taking uh, the, the um, ideas of a, of a, um, a legal philosopher and, uh, and defining what is a legal system versus what is a system of culture and mores and trying to apply that to three traditional cultures um, that had existed over time and determining whether or not what they had was a, a social system or whether it was truly a legal system in the way that modern folks think about a legal system. And so again, it, it basically allowed me to explore the fact that human culture always has to solve the same problems. There are different ways of achieving those solutions not one better than the other, just different. Um, and that over time, any system has to be adaptive. It has to be able, if it's gonna survive, it has to be able to react to what it's learning from the application in real time. And I think, again, those are some of the things that as, as we've explored lean construction and sort of the transformation associated with how projects are delivered. I think those ideas have been foundational to understanding we have to get into action with whatever ideas we develop, but we're going to learn while we're in action and we have to adapt as we go. I think that's really interesting because I've been, I've been trying to tap into uh, what are the hereditaments or the, you know, what are the outstanding features of different cultures and, um, and how they work. And it seems to be like four different things. There's, there's language, which is really important. And being in Canada, um, I really respect the fact that the French Canadians have saved their language as a constitutional matter, because it's just so you know, incredibly important to culture. Um, and then there's, like you said, the norms and the mores, which I think of as, these are the things that we believe and we believe so much in them that we actually teach them. And we try to teach them because we think the future generations will benefit from that. And that is the thing that keeps us in the, uh, keeps us between the lines, whatever those lines happen to be in our culture. Uh, and then there's artifacts. And I always think of uh, really, Part of American culture, if you can even think about America as having a culture, which I wonder on a regular basis because it seems to be so kind of crazed, but the artifacts of American culture seem to be logos and brands and, and commercial uh, creations like 60 second commercials that seems to be the quintessential art form developed by America. There's some really incredibly good creative 60 second commercials. Uh, but they seem to re revolve around that kind of artifact of brand that people are trying to create. Yeah, I think when you think about it, we try to identify some of our artifacts and the sort of the culture around that. You think of the Declaration of Independence or the Constitution. Um, and I think what you learn over time is that um, you can have an artifact and, and different people can certainly take away very different ideas of what they stand for. And so I think, again, as you're thinking about how to build a culture, 
you have to be intentional. You have to think about, and what do I need to say, do, how do I need to behave as a leader in order for my actions to reinforce what we're saying we want the culture to be? And, and how do we implement the artifacts in a way so that there's a uniform understanding of what they mean to us? Because it's not about just in isolation, what the thing is or what the thing means. It has to be taken in by the individuals who then have to li live and behave in a way that helps to move those ideas forward and, and use those artifacts in a way that's beneficial to the organization. So again, I think that that the ideas that come out of studying traditional cultures, which is really the, in my view, the difference between anthropology and sociology is often the area at which they focus. They often look at many of the same things. Um, but you recognize that for thousands and thousands of years, people have had to solve the same basic problems. And the way that they do that is different. And those cultures that tend to survive are those that are able to adapt as new information is integrated into their worldview. So, and again, I think that that applies to what we've done in lean construction as well. I added in, in spades, I think. Um, so you moved from, from anthropology, you, you must have known that you were headed to law school if that was your uh, thesis. I mean, my thesis was uh, a dramatic recreation of John Brown's body by Stephen Vincent Benet, which was <laughs> acting scenarios over two nights. And it was, I was, it was a ton of fun, but I thought I was going to go be a history teacher someplace. Never really thought that I was going to be the third generation of lawyers in my family. Yeah, so as I was moving through college, I, I really had two ambitions. One was to go to law school. Not surprisingly, the other was to go into construction. <laughs> <laughs> really? so, and so, so again, I think that I made the initial move to go to law school, figuring that that would be a good foundation. Uh, came out of law school now 40 years ago, spent a couple of years working for a federal district court judge in Sacramento, and then almost immediately coming out of that clerkship after two years, went into practicing construction law. So pretty quickly that the dual ambitions came together uh, with the, the legal background and the focus on the construction industry. And then I was in the construction practice, being a lawyer in the construction arena uh, for over 25 years before I came on to the ideas of lean construction and, and sort of began to migrate my career into the next phase. Yeah, that's fantastic. Because I, I was just going to ask you, what were the what were the things that um, kind of motivated you to to share that nexus between construction and and the law? When I was coming out of law school, I just wanted to be a I wanted to be a a, a blue max litigator, and that was in commercial litigation. And it turned out that commercial litigation with complicated commercial litigation was either construction or securities law. So I just ended up doing both of those things because they were they were kind of similar and we didn't really have uh, in, the, at least in Colorado, there wasn't so much a construction bar as there was kind of a commercial litigator bar, but you did a lot of commercial litigation as well. I mean, construction litigation. Yeah, I did. I did a fair range of it. So it, again, when I came to the law firm that I work for, it was actually um, had a construction law practice. It, it, one of the partners that initially founded the firm was Henry Teichert. And in California, in construction circles, everybody knows Teichert because it has the oldest active contractor's license in the state of California, <laughs> license number eight. Wow. Uh, and and uh, Henry's grandfather was actually part of the group that actually founded the Contractor State License Board in California. So uh, construction and construction law was in the in the actual formation of the law firm. And, and when I joined, they basically asked whether I would be willing to, to take my skills and abilities and apply them to construction and not tongue in cheek. I said, well, as long as you're willing to give me a paycheck, I'm willing to work in, in that area. It turned out I, I loved it and, and became really uh, passionate about construction law. But initially it was one of those uh, things where opportunity Met initiative, and that's sort of where I had the first opportunity to apply my craft as a lawyer. So, and that and continued was... for a number of years. Again, I I uh, I was a 
I'll call it a, a vintage construction lawyer. I did transactional practice. I did advice of clients. We developed contracts. You know, I would provide advice when when they had challenges, either in the uh, labor arena or with ongoing execution of construction contracts. Um, I represented both contractors and owners. I represented architects, engineers, sureties, the whole range of the construction law uh, constellation, if you will, um, and handled litigation, handled major disputes with um, owners and, and contractors typically um, where things had not gone well on construction projects. And as a result, uh, Donnie Brook broke out at the end where you spent a lot of money on claims consultants and lawyers and got to the end game, whether it's negotiated or by judgment. And usually nobody was happy uh, except for the lawyers and the claims consultants because <laughs> they had they had been successful in plying their trade and driving towards an outcome. But oftentimes the both sides or the multiple parties that were involved ended up feeling like it really wasn't the kind of process or outcome that they were hoping for when they signed up for that project. So I think I think I I saw that increasingly over time of, of the dissatisfaction, if you will, with the way that design construction litigate was um really the the delivery model that became prevalent, at least when I was practicing. It was certainly it was certainly that way when I was practicing as well. And it was always the thing that struck me um, when I would, and I represented that whole kind of panoply as well. On on the other side, I represented both um, plaintiffs and um, uh, both victims and uh, securities brokers. <laughs> and the security side in, in construction, I always wondered, well, how could you not have known that? And it was kind of on the security side too. It's like, how did you believe that this guy was telling you? How could that possibly be true? But there's a lot more fraud in securities than there is in construction. But basically, you're a you're a fraud lawyer and you're a contract lawyer, right? I mean, those are the two basic things that you look at in in both construction and securities. Um, and it was really claims consultants. That's where you met Greg Howell, I think, right? It is. So um, back in the early '80s, actually, I was handling uh, part of a construction dispute, um, and we had both time impact claims, but we also had loss of productivity claims. And so we were working to retain an expert to, to support our claims of uh, loss of efficiency, loss of productivity on the job. And at that time, Greg was one of the two leading national experts on loss of productivity claims. Greg used to, to tease everybody that I used to describe him as the inefficiency expert which he said, I knew way too much about him personally if I was calling him the inefficiency expert. <laughs> um, but that is where I met Greg and, and he uh, he came in and, and I was responsible for developing his testimony and then ultimately him testimony in the, in the hearing. That was, again, one of these Donnie Brooks, I think we had 43 days of arbitration. Um, so you can imagine the amount of money that was wrapped up just in the in the transactional costs associated with resolving the disputes at the end of the job. Oh, yeah. uh, but that is where I first met Greg. He did a, a, a fantastic job testifying. I, I recently, I, I, as, uh, as I was rooting through my notes, I actually found my notes of his examination. So the outline I had for his examination. Wow. Um, and it was, again, I think that it was, you could see even back then in the, in the early 80s, some of the same kernels of what ultimately shaped into the lean construction movement that that he and Glenn really led in the United States and and those emerging ideas of his around the way teams work together and the way production is actually managed. So it was a, a great opportunity to uh, I'll say learn from from Greg and and it was the first introduction we had to each other back in the eighties. That's, that's fantastic. I mean, I wish I'd known him as long as. Uh as you've known him. Um, but I, so one of the things I'm, I'm wondering about, I mean, you started talking to Greg and you, you, you got deeply immersed in being in, an expert in construction law. And you look at some of the things that developed in construction law um, that the owner is impliedly warrants the plans that are built and uh, means and methods are uh, the responsibility of the contractor and 
design is the responsibility of the designer. And we try to turn all that stuff on its head because we know it doesn't work very well um, in the in the lean area and especially in the IPD, which you were really the grandfather of from my perspective. Um, so did you ever, would, when was the first inkling that, wow, the system just doesn't work very well? And I wonder if it's the system or if it's, uh, what, what, are, what were the parts of the system that you said, wow, this, is, this doesn't make sense to me? So if, if I go back, Dick, I, I guess I would say my, uh, my sense that things were broken was developed mm -hmm. over time. But there actually was a dispute that really led me to a crossroads per personally and professionally. So I was representing a mechanical contractor who had a claim for construction of a laboratory building at UC Berkeley. And as a trade contractor, it was one of multiple trades that had claims against the general contractor because of the kinds of uh, disabilities, if you will, that that exist on typical projects, that the plans were incomplete, the responses to questions were often untimely and often created more problems than they solved in, in how the trade contractors had to move forward. Um, so it, it, as that job matured, again, we, we ended up flying a filing a claim. I think there were eight other trade contractors who filed claims that General contractor then filed a claim against the university. The university then filed claims against all the design professionals. And we really did begin down that pathway of uh, the vintage construction Donnybrook. And we had gone through various aspects of discovery. We had exchanged documents and exchanged written interrogatories that people were supposed to provide written responses to and it had begun the deposition process. And we had moved into mediation and we were using one of the, at that time, one of the, the nation's recognized experts in construction mediation. And we had done a, a, a day of mediation and then everybody had, he wanted people to go do more discovery. So we had gone away and done some more depositions. And I think we were finally in the third day of mediation. And as happens in mediation, all the lawyers for all the parties, representatives of the parties, all the claims consultants uh, need to be present. And then there's this form of shuttle diplomacy that the mediator often engages with. So you have a, a large group of the participants actually sitting in a big room, so I call it the bullpen, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, waiting for their moment in the ring. Um, and um, during this third day of mediation that this group of a virtual who's who of construction lawyers and claims consultants from Northern California were sitting together and, and I asked the question, why are we here? <laughs> and everybody else sort of looked at me and said, well, we're here for the third day of mediation. Well, what, why are you here? And I said, no, really, why are we here? This, this system seems to be very, very broken. I said, nothing we're doing here is going to produce a better set of laboratories for the for the professors or for the students. It's it's not adding value. What why are we here? What's broken in the way that we develop, design, and construct facilities so that this is pretty much a typical outcome? All these people sitting together trying to to settle a multi-million dollar construction dispute. Well, I guess I would say everybody had ideas, but nobody really had an answer. Right. And so for me, that that was sort of a turning point uh, for me in, in, in terms of thinking about maybe I don't want to just be a vulture living off the waste of failed <laughs> projects. Right. Wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice to be able to begin to figure out what is the root cause of, of these project failures and how do we begin redesigning and transforming, if you will, the design and construction industry in a way that we can eliminate the need for these kinds of dispute resolution processes. Because again, they're they're on all non-value added. They're not creating value for anybody. Right. So what might we do differently? It's funny, I had a similar kind of uh, aha moment as we like to talk about in the lean industry when uh, my second son, Henry, was born in 1984. Uh, four days after that, I started an arbitration that went every day at four days a week from seven in the morning until noon until July 1st. 
from March 30th. <laughs> and we ended up getting a, a decision from the arbitration panel. This was a big, you know, this was a several uh, tens of million dollars worth of damages on a condominium that had decided to try to upgrade during the, the great nickel stock market in Denver. And then when that fell apart, everything fell apart and it ended up being auctioned off. Um, but we ended up getting a decision from the three member panel that was a number. And it was so disheartening <laughs> that I spent that long. And, and, and it wasn't a bad number for my client. It wasn't necessarily a good number. It was just a number. And there was no explanation. There was no there was no attempt to say, well, here's what you did wrong. And maybe you should think about this next time. And and here's where, you know, you were kind of right about this. Like you're used to sitting with a judge in a settlement conference saying, well, I'm looking at these things. And so I became, after that, I started working uh, part-time as an arbitrator for the AAA. And I went on and got um, credentialed as a mediator because I just kept thinking there's got to be a better way sure. to get these things happening. But both in arbitration and mediation, you're still in a dispute. Right. I mean, you're still think of it. Think, think of it as it, in the in the lean language, you already you have a defect. The, the you have right. a problem that you're having to to remedy simply because you had a defect. And I'll, I I I guess I would say, right. Dick, as I as I continued to reflect and began to learn, and we can talk about how I reconnected with Greg and how that all came together. I I guess what I would say, and you've seen some of the graphics I've been using for the last. Um, 20 years now, I guess it is, that that I, I really came to the conclusion that the root cause of much of the disputes or disagreements or failures in the construction industry were the lack of a common understanding among the project participants of either the purpose or the project or the details that, that oftentimes it wasn't that people were malicious or ill-intended or, but they would think that they had solved a problem by something they had represented either on paper or in a bid or in a letter. But the other side would walk away with a very different understanding of what that meant or what it was. And, and oftentimes, as soon as you began talking about the lack of common understanding, it really resulted in, now think about the word here, disagreement. It was right. really reinforcing the fact that they didn't have a common understanding that one side thought it meant X and the other side thought it meant Y and that they became more and more entrenched in trying to prove that their side was right rather than understanding what had actually contributed to that disagreement and trying to fix that at least on the next project. So I think for me, at least this idea of the absence of common understanding as a root cause really ends up precipitating some of the work that we did moving forward to try to, we often describe it as reintegrate a disintegrated industry. Yeah, I've thought for, for a long time, I, I agree completely with, with that in terms of like the lack of transparency, but the, the sort of Damocles that hung over everybody's head and what made them so necessarily argumentative and get their backs up was that um, in this series of bilateral, bilateral contracts that we created in order to sell risk, somebody was always going to lose. <laughs> and, and that loser didn't want to lose. They, they did not go easily to the scaffold. Um, and they were constantly looking for, you know, ways out of it. And I think that, uh, I, I do think that the nature of those bilateral contracts, and when you move out of that into a relational contract where everybody kind of sinks and swims together right. that re-incentivizes people to have to work stuff out because if you don't work it out you know there's there's a leak in the boat and rowing faster is not going to get you to the other side absolutely so i think again when when we began the conversation so so again after that uh mediation experience i i made the personal decision that I knew what contributed to failed projects. I mean, I think lawyers largely are students of failed projects. Right. Um, but what made a project work? What are what are the things that would contribute to project success? What could you do in the, the planning and the programming and the design phase 
that would set a project up better for success. And so my initial thought was, well, maybe I need to go back to school and 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 learn more about how good projects come together. So my reach to Greg Howell at, at that moment in my uh, life was actually to seek career counseling, if you will, to, to reach back to Greg and say, here's the dilemma I face. What should I do to try to close the gap on, on my lack of uh, knowledge, if you will, in that area? And so as I went to look Greg up again, I, I actually bumped across some of the early writings from LCI, from the Lean Construction Institute. And they were on the, the old LCI website. And, and um, I began reading those white papers and it's like, wow, this, this actually makes sense. They're, they're looking at some of the same fundamental issues that I'm describing. Maybe the thing to do is to, to connect in with the uh, emerging thinking of LCI and see what we can learn together. So I think that's really where what brought um, me back in contact with Greg and and then into the lean community was just that curiosity I had trying to understand what what would actually contribute to project success rather than uh, a, a very expensive resolution of a project failure. Yeah, that's funny because the. Um... I mean, this is joined her with a guy who's in the front lines, right? This is uh, you're you're trying to look at at you know military. Uh, it's like instead of going to the Navy War College, you just kind of go right up front with Stanley McChrystal and the boys <laughs> and see how you handle it. Because Greg right. and Greg and Glenn and Lori Koskala and Iris, they're all on the front lines of trying to figure out how you actually build a production system around construction. And they weren't so much, I don't think interested in, wow, how do contracts drive us to bad behavior and the rest of the kinds of things that you and I were possibly thinking about. They were thinking about organically, how does this, how does the system fail to produce the results that it expects to produce? Because like you said, these were not evil people. They, they expected to produce a result and they expected that a schedule would help them produce it. And they expected that an estimate would help them produce it. And and those things failed them in so many different ways for reasons that we now have studied. Um, so you reconnected with Greg and, and your conversations, I guess, and your friendship developed from that. It, it did. And, and that was at the same time that I had been asked to help represent Sutter Health in the way that they were going to move forward on their multi-billion dollar construction program. Um, so after a period of time, uh, we actually connected Sutter and into the LCI, we we actually attended a meeting. Uh, interestingly enough, it was a, a meeting where LCI, a small group, was actually considering what role does contracts play in the ability to achieve lean construction. And it was uh, probably 10 people that were in the room at, in a meeting room in Las Vegas with Greg and Glenn. Um, I think that was like 2006 or something, right? Ish. Well, I think this one was actually earlier than that. This was oh, okay. when we actually moved to the relational contracting meeting. Nice. So this was actually a precursor to Sutter making the commitment to take the program lean. So it was actually earlier than that. We we met with them. Um, we understood some of the basics of the ideas. And coming out of that meeting, Dave Pixley, on behalf of Sutter Health made the commitment that we're going to try this within our program. So we, from that point forward, we were engaged with uh, Greg and then Hal Maycumber because the two of them were working together um, and really began the effort to develop the Sutter initiative. And that was in the early 2000s, um, probably 2002 or thereabouts, so almost 20 years ago. Wow! When we when we first began doing that, and again, the idea was to 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 lay the groundwork within Sutter and its project management staff, together with Sutter's vendor community, around what would it feel like, what would we need to do together in order to begin to transform the way that we thought about how we work together in design and construction. So this is a chicken and egg kind of question that lawyers love to ask uh, because there's, there's a lot of lawyers out there that believe that 
the contract drives behavior. So if we do a good contract, then man will have a really good procedure. But what I'm what I'm hearing, I think I'm hearing, is that organically you had to develop a system that would work, and then a contract was the way that you wrapped up the package at the end. Yeah. So so Greg and I shared a mental framework around project delivery, and and people have seen it now emerge basically as the LCI triangle. Mm -hmm. The idea that all project delivery systems have an organizational structure, how, how you bring people together, um, how they're brought on to the team, how governance works within a project team. So they have, they have organizational structure they have to deal with. They have an operating system. And what we were saying is that there's a traditional operating system, the sort of the CII um, it model, if you will, that the, the, the traditional CPM based kind of thinking about project reductionism. And what we were saying is lean provides a very different operating system. And so we actually embrace that language of operating system going back to your comment about language, because it, it was something that was as different at, at that point in time between the Windows operating system and the Mac operating system. And we really wanted people to understand this was a fundamental shift. It was not just a different shade of project delivery. So you had right. organizational structure, operating system, and commercial terms. And the belief was if you designed the way that you wanted to organize and you designed the way that you wanted to operate, then you needed to have the commercial terms established. So risk and reward, how people are paid um, and the like in a way that supported the way that you were saying that people wanted to work together. So that's really, that framework is what led us to, to lead with organization and operating system and then wrap that in a commercial blanket that would then support what we were trying to achieve overall. And I think that's really interesting because I think other lawyers have come to it from the other side, like the Gary, uh, what's that guy's name, Barry Parmeter, who wrote broke, Broken Buildings, Broken Budgets or whatever. Um, he's got, the first half of that book is marvelous because it just details all the things that are so wrong with the industry. And then he comes out with, well, we just need a stronger contract. We just need to, to beat on people harder. And that's not I, that's not where you guys ended up, which is no, it it fantastic. wasn't. And and you know, there's it was an evolution, I'll say, to get to uh, the genesis of the IFOA. So as we were moving through the system at Sutter, we had regular meetings with what we called the vendor community, and, and they were called vendor vendor forums. And uh, what it was was we we would help teams begin to implement the operating system and and organize differently and we would come together on like quarterly to to listen to what was being learned in the community because the idea is we had to create a learning community different teams would have different experiences but that the way that we could accelerate learning across the program was to have these routines where we brought everybody together and we asked what's working what's not working what do we need to keep doing, stop doing, and start doing? Um, and in one of those meetings, um, a, a brave engineer raised her hand <laughs> and basically said, we have a problem because you're asking us to behave very differently, to work together differently. But at this point, your contract is still saying everything that the contract has al always said. Would you be willing to consider changing the way that your contract is put together in order to make it more sympathetic to the way that you're asking us to work together. And that really was the, the problem statement, if you will, for going to work to figure out what might an agreement look like that was both relational, but then integrated into it, the operating system and the organizational structure that had been emerging in the, in the Sutter program. So where, where did you, where along the line, I'm assuming it's it's around this time, but it could have been before that you ran into Ian McNeil and the whole relational contracting paradigm, because it's a, a very different contractual paradigm than what we learned in law school and what people are still learning in law school about contracts. So the Ian McNeil connection, it's funny because at that contract meeting I initially referred to, right. Greg was a master of many different domains. Let me just say that. He was he was not only into engineering. He was into 
poetry and he was into legal philosophy. So he, you know, he was a broad thinking guy and, and he had been um, versed in Ian McNeil and Williamson who had talked about relational contracting. And, and the first time I talked to him about that was actually that initial meeting in Las Vegas, which was probably a couple years before we actually began to move the ideas forward into the IFOA. Mm. And so we we basically had had Sutter now saying, we probably need to think differently about how we're contracting. You had LCI, that initial meeting that we had in Las Vegas, the, the basic tenor of the room was, we don't think contracts are essential, but they certainly can get in the way. And I think over the course of the ensuing couple of years, we actually came to the conclusion that they actually were essential because they did get in the way. So you you had to go to work. You couldn't do things simply because the contract said you needed to do them that way. We, you know, we often embraced that famous quote from Lyndon Johnson, you can tell them to go to hell, but they just won't go. <laughs> so you could put it in the contract, but unless you had a, a very different way of, of transforming the culture and behaviors, folks really weren't going to do it simply because it was in the contract. That's naive. But we did decide we needed to study what is a relational contract and how would we put those kinds of terms in place and then integrate into that both the operating system, the lean operating system, as well as the organizational structure of shared governance that, I mean, has basically become second nature in IPD projects. But we had to put that all in one place. So you basically had a, a roadmap, if you were will, for lean integrated project delivery. And that was really what uh, caused us then to hold the uh, relational contracting symposium, which was the meeting in Atlanta that, that you might have been referring to earlier, where we brought together scholars and, and practitioners from around the world who had used different forms of relational contracts uh, to present what they had learned and, and what had been successful and what the challenges had been as those types of agreements were brought forward in the industries around the world. So some of that was from uh, project alliancing down from Australia. Some of that was from uh, the work that had been done uh, in Great Britain as a result of the Egan report. So again, it was beginning to assemble uh, world best thinking around relational contracting. And at the end of that meeting, uh, the question was really asked, it's like, well, all the other organizations that are trying to change the way projects are delivered have a contract that basically provides the, the template or the roadmap for how that would be achieved. Should LCI have one? And if so, who is prepared to volunteer to make that happen? And everybody so, was suddenly looking in your direction. Everybody was suddenly it. looking. And I said, sure. I mean, this is a confluence of both, I'll say LCI saying, this would be a great launch pad for us to have organizationally. I had Sutter also saying, we need to be responsive to the vendor community and develop uh, what ultimately became the integrated form of agreement. Um, and that was in November of, uh, I think it was 2004. And from there, I, I went to work between then and, and the end of the year, basically crafting what became the initial version of the IFOA. Which was uh, which we we were able to review and learn from at the prison healthcare project, and I remember it being um, almost a thesis on how to develop trusting relationships in light of the evil that surrounds us in the world. I just I really did love it because it, it was such a deep dive. Uh, but I remember looking at paragraph eleven point two point seven or whatever and said, the, the parties will trust each other. And I remember asking, well, how do you enforce that? I mean, I'm, here I come from a you know, civil litigation background, and it says it's in the contract, it was in the contract, it sounds like it's enforceable. So how do you enforce that? And you went, it, it's not meant to be enforced. It just enforces itself. And I was going, boom, and that just turned on another light for me um, that, was, uh, that really kind of got me over the top around this to say, from my perspective, the contract is really meaningless 
except for the fact that it provides the forum for what we're trying to do. And it doesn't, it doesn't disincentivize uh, good behavior, which is what standard contracts tend to do. Yeah, I think, I think you're onto it, Dick. I think as we began using the IFOA, teams often held study action teams on the contract. And, and so that they could learn together what they were committing to and then ask themselves, in order to achieve these objectives, what do we need to do as a team in order to have the right process, the right behaviors, et cetera, in place so that we can achieve these objectives? And in some ways, the reason for putting some of those things in the contract was so people had the cover of the contract, meaning... Right. You know, that their boss, whoever had signed the agreement, their corporate structure had said, yes, we're prepared to change the way we work together with the other team members that we have here. And you have permission to do things differently than the way we've done them inside our organization, maybe for the last 20 or 30 years. So it was often to be able just to use it as a touchstone to move back to and say, see, Everybody has agreed, including your senior executives, this is the way we need to move forward. And then we would use the meetings of the senior management team. Again, those, those individuals within each of the companies that were sort of removed from day-to-day -day project management, but owned the outcome of the project for the organizations to reinforce with the project team, how do we make sure that we're doing the things necessary in order to achieve these objectives? <laughs> rather than ask ourselves afterwards, how would we fail to meet these objectives and how are we gonna punish the folks that, that didn't play by the rules? So again, it was a very different way of thinking about the role of a contract in developing the way that a project was delivered. And here we are almost 20 years later and I sit with senior management teams all the time and there's seven or eight of them that go, is that what we were meant to agree to? <laughs> I didn't really understand that because in Canada, it's really, it's, it's wonderful working in Canada because it's a very, um, it, it's a very different structure and the, and the legal system is, is different here. And the Canadians really believe in contracts. That's what got them in trouble with vaccines. They had a big contract, early contract for vaccines and, and the vaccine uh, guys went, no, no, we're going to sell them over here because we've been ordered by this country to sell them to Belgium. And it's like, what happened to our contract? Oh my God, what happened? Um, and the contractors up here, you know, they're doing really well. They're just fine. So this really becomes an opportunity for an owner to say, we're not doing fine. We want a different, you know, you used to say as a contractor, you can go to an owner and say, I have a different offer in the marketplace. And in Canada, the owners are saying, we want a different offer in the marketplace. And this is the offer that we want. And if you want our work, you need to learn how to do this, and which is a very kind of different thing than than happened in the states, because the states is is much more you know companies like Bolt and EPR and some of those early adopters really took it to heart that it did mean a significant change in the way they did business. Yeah, I think I think we've experienced both, Dick. I think that we can go to customers and say we think we have a better way of delivering a project. But ultimately, the only opportunities we get are when they embrace those ideas. So ultimately, it comes down to the owners believing that the current method of delivering projects is not optimal and that there's got to be a better way. We, we often say that uh, I was on a panel earlier this year with, with Digby and uh, Stuart Ekblad from UCSF. And as leaders in the, in the sort of the IPD environment, each of them has said, we just got to the point where we concluded that the old way was sufficiently broken, that the new way would not be any worse. Yeah. And so we, we, we figured that, that even if, if we didn't achieve stellar outcomes, it would definitely be better and certainly no worse than traditional project delivery, especially across a program of work. So again, I think that we've continued in, as an LCI community to help both educate and empower owners to ask for something different, uh, to understand what it means for their internal organizations to ask for something different, because you can't, as an owner, ask the whole supply chain to behave differently, and then you continue to behave in the way that you've always behaved. 
Right. And so there's transformational change that needs to happen within those organizations as well. Um, but we're trying to help them understand that there is a better future if they're willing to embrace change, if they're willing to em embrace a new way of solving the problem. Yeah, I thought it was funny, and, and this is this is a line that Digby always gets a gets a laugh on. You and Digby were at uh, LCI, and I think Stuart was supposed to be on that panel but couldn't make it. And you were talking about the future of of things, and somebody asked the question, "So, how did you get started, Digby?" And he goes, "Well, we had the temerity to just ask that the project be delivered for the cost you said it could be delivered for, and in the time it could be delivered." What? A revolutionary request <laughs> to ask you to perform the contract. Oh, uh, that was just, uh, it, but it's true that, you know, 70% of the time it just doesn't get performed. And that's as it's amended 15 different times to give people more money and more time. Uh, you know, it's just, it's great. So um, let me just, uh, let me ask a couple other things as we sure. get, as we get sure. into this. Uh, you know, people listen to this podcast, I think, because they like to hear the stories and they like to hear all the stuff that we've been talking about. But the great uh, cook and bottle washer and storyteller of our community was really Greg. And you had a, a terrific long term friendship and relationship with him over the years. Uh, what do you think his his legacy is to our to our community and our industry? If you can talk about it without tearing up. <laughs> yeah, I'll try to I'll try to do that. So. So I think the thing that impressed me most about Greg was his willingness to be curious and to be motivated to explore that curiosity. Um, he, he, as we said earlier, he was not monodimensional. He was, he was a guy that was always looking and willing to look across the range of, of both scholarly work, but also just things in the, in the, literature that were available, you know, things in the news that might be applicable. And, and he was a, a person who was an integrator of thoughts. Um, you know, the, the, the fact that we have uh, Fernando Flores coming in with the language action model, and that Greg was able to see a way to embrace that and to integrate it with the last planner system, so that they didn't sit separately but he was the great integrator. He could figure out a way to bring those together and link them, link them up. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think Greg could see the world both the way that it was and also for the way that it could be. So he was, I, I think of him as being an optimist and that, that he fueled that optimism with curiosity uh, to, to try to drive different thinking under, underneath what we could do in response to the the things in our industry that were broken. And one of his great gifts was that he he took this learning that, and he was learning every single day, whether it was capturing the Macau or whatever that bird was that he caught in, <laughs> in Milwaukee or just, a, you know, whether it was um, you guys were on a trip someplace and I think your wife bought a big giant stone that he wondered how she was going to get home. But just all the crazy stuff that he did, he was, he was not a guy that stood up and told you what he knew with a PowerPoint. He was a guy who told you stories. And from those stories, the parables, you were supposed to draw the key points. And he knew that, that eventually you'd have to have that story yourself. You'd have to live that story. And so things like the airplane game and the parade of trades and the make a card game, and, uh, silent squares, these were all build as many roads as you can. All those simulations were in some ways a way of of Greg and, and Glenn and the others, uh, you telling stories that people would experience and they would experience in a way where they would go, wow, that's crazy. Why would we be sitting there waiting for five batches of stuff to be done before we could do something else? Um, and I think that was uh, one of his great gifts. What are, do you remember, can you share a couple of stories with us that resonate with you? Like every day you look at something and you go, oh, geez, that's a great story. Yeah, so I, I do think obviously Greg was a great storyteller. I, um, it was often the case that you he would uh, the the stories would evolve over time, so that that um, oftentimes they I know how that is. Better, <laughs> yeah, they became enriched over time, right? But the the uh, the one story that Greg used to tell 
all the time about um, how we assure we have a mutual understanding of the conditions of satisfaction was the story about the time um, that he was walking with Dana in Idaho. And it was uh, it was early fall. And um, they were walking past it. They had a house and, and they had a lawn out front and they were walking down the driveway. And, and Dana said, uh, the grass is getting long. And Greg said that when he would tell the story, he said his initial reaction was, well, I better get back here and mow the lawn because my wife is making the observation that the grass is getting long. And he said they walked a little ways further and Dana said, I really like it that way. And so the light bulb again went on and I said, well, I could have come away with an assumption from what somebody said to me of what it is that they actually wanted. But unless I actually explore that and really come to a common understanding, if you will, of, of what the person desired, what they wanted, then the chances are I will go off and work really hard to produce a result that nobody wants. Right. So that was always one that that I really uh, uh, appreciated because, again, he could use a very simple story um, to make a very important point, one that is you know sort of fundamental to the way that we approach what we do every day and in, in conversation to make sure that that when we're talking to each other, we actually are are building mutual understanding, not just talking to each other. Yeah, he had to, he had that that ability to to draw people out. I, I think in addition to his tremendous curiosity, which I think uh, all of us who were good friends, are, you're a tremendously curious person. You look at my room here. <laughs> I'm obviously a tremendously curious person, but he was he was incredibly humble about it as well. I remember him starting off uh, and. and an exorcist or whatever by saying, well, here's here's an interpretation of why that system didn't work. There could be others. <laughs> and he always gave a nod to the fact that he didn't have the cardinal rule or or the ultimate uh, solution. And I think that that was it was so in into Greg to be a countermeasure guy as opposed to a solution guy. And uh, I think that's absolutely. And I think some folks think the last planner system, for example, was developed initially as a whole system, that, that all the components that exist today uh, were, were cleaved onto a couple of, of rocks and walked down from the top of the mountain. And, and when you learn about the way that the last planner system was actually invented and evolved over years, it's exactly what you describe, is they did, the, they did their first study and came away with an understanding of the need to have reliable promises and weekly work plans that actually were based on what people really believed that they could get done. And as they implemented that and, and new problems exposed themselves in what was causing the breakdown in PPC, they would then look and say, okay, what do we need to do differently to augment what we currently have in place to address this new set of problems that's emerging? And so really the last planner system as it's known in the community today, probably developed over seven or eight years as they had enough opportunity to implement, study, learn, and then adjust the way that they were thinking about things to address the realities of what was happening on the ground. So I think when you talk about Greg's humility, he also understood that you weren't going to design the perfect solution. You were going to come up with a countermeasure, you were gonna put it in action, you were gonna prototype it, you were gonna learn along the way, and then you were gonna continuously improve it. So that's why the lean ideal really resonated with the way that he and Glenn approached things, because that's that's how they thought about uh, action-based research, was you, you come up with a, a good idea, you put it in action, you learn from that, and then you modify and, and move it forward. Yeah, he was uh, he was really he was terrific at that. And I think finally, I think one of the things that I so respected in him is he was a very complete systems thinker. 
he thought in systems. He didn't think in pieces and parts necessarily. He thought about, I mean, he was happy to, to do something to tweak a part of the system, but he was really interested in how it affected the rest of the system and how unintended consequences get us into trouble. And uh, so his, his ideas around transparency and and collaboration always seemed to me to be really you know, dead on in terms of um, systems thinking. Yep. Yeah. He always was thinking at, at, at that level. So if we do this over here, what's the implication over there? And sometimes in ways that others had not thought about so that it at least allowed us to to put a measure in place to to see what the implications might be there as we began to implement. So it was, you're right, he was a very broad thinker in that way. Well, and he's he's left us to uh, carry on the journey for him. So you're you're at Bolt. You've been at Bolt for oh, what must be 10, 12 years, something like that. It's yeah, about twelve years. Um, so congratulations on your longevity there, and and congratulations on your escape from <laughs> from the law. Yes. Uh, to do something important. Um, and you have a role there as like chief innovation officer or something. I know Concher, when he was at Belfer, had the role of chief innovation officer, but that's pretty much what your, uh, what your job is, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I do try to drive our internal transformation as well as the way that we're trying to transform the industry as well. So I think that that's whatever my position title is, I think that's my major function is to to help us in the industry uh, transform. And so uh, one of, some of the things that I've attributed to you over, as quotes, and you've, you've either uh, corrected me or not, there's two, two that I, I love. One is that you would come up with that figure of Scaramooch or whatever and say, are we hopeless victims of fate? Or are, are our hands, you know, can, can we actually do something about stuff? Um, and the other is that we have more to learn from sharing than we do by by holding close to the best. And I know you attribute that to, to others, but I think that's been so much a part of your life in the community. And you have just been an enormous sharer of stuff without having to keep it, you know, copyrighted somewhere deep in a drawer. Right. Uh, I, so I do think, so I do think this idea um, around being able to see the world for what it could be rather than for what it is. Mm. It's something that I've come to, I'll say, accept and appreciate about who I am as a person. Um, I've also learned over time that that doesn't mean the rest of the world sees things that way yeah. or is ready to move as quickly as I would be ready to move. I've, I've learned that about myself as well. I, I tend to be a unique blend of um, creativity or the ability to see a different future and very quick to action. Um, let's get it in action, somewhat like Greg, let's get it in action and see what we can learn together rather than let's study this, study this, study this, study this. Right. Um, and I've, I've learned that you can only, um, you can only, so sometimes they say the speed of the leader is the speed of the team. I've actually learned that the, the speed of the team is the speed of the leader. Right. You can't move any faster than the team that you're leading, whether it's a project team or a company is prepared to move. You can you can outrun your air cover that way. Right. So I think that, that that's an important part of it. I, I think that um, the other thing is, as, as you said, uh, in addition to thinking that there must be a better way, is is just the um, the ability, if you will, to to constantly forge forward. It's it's like not to be daunted by the fact of the challenge, whatever the challenge is, but to, just to keep, I, I put a, a quote on my whiteboard behind me that is, um, you know, you just you just have to be um, constant pressure, relentlessly applied. Constant pressure, relentlessly applied. So you're, you're never backing up to the point where you're not con continuing to have a hand on the back and making sure that people are able to move forward. Um, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're not able to move just as fast as you would as an organizational leader. you got to make sure that the rest of the team is prepared to move as well. And I think sometimes your, your hand is on their back helping them move forward, and sometimes your hand is out catching them when they fall. Yes. Because that's, uh, you know, the, the backup of it all. Um, so you do have this, this incredible ability to think about 
how the world could look. So, uh, you know, you reach the age where you could make the Social Security election, I guess. Um, that's been made for me <laughs> at my age. Uh, so in this kind of, you know, in the, uh, in, the, in the sunset of our years, hopefully it's a long sunset. Um, what's next for you? What are you looking forward to for not only Bolt, but what's Willick be doing out there uh, in the future? Sure. So again, I think even after 20 years at this, Dick, I think we're still on the, what I call the toe of the slope. Um, I, I think, again, we've made tremendous progress and the big part of the curve, if you will, of adoption of these ideas across the industry and across the world is, is yet to be traversed. Um, I think one of the things that, and you may have heard me mention this in a couple of the forum that I've spoken recently in, is this idea of trying to return joy to the construction industry. Mm. Um, and again, it was it was me reflecting on, you know, what is it about our industry that both attracts people to want to work on IPD projects, but also discourages them from wanting to be in our industry overall. And I do think that that we talk now a lot about this idea of work-life balance. And, and I go back, you know, when we were working on the prison receivership together, we had probably 200 people um, that were working really hard, really long hours, really long days, many times more than five days a week. And they were loving it. Right. Because they were getting joy from it. And so you have to ask yourself, what is it about those circumstances that don't have people saying, it's five o'clock, I need to go. Instead, what else can I do to help move this program forward? And, and what is it that causes that internal sense of joy, which enables people to feel like what they're doing is actually valuable and rewarding? Um, so I think both internally and in the industry, I think one of the things I'm trying to help us do is to understand what are those things that we have to get really good at to be able to enable folks to get joy out of what they do every day. Um, and I go back to, again, talking about pulling from, from different folks or different chains of thinking. Um, Paul O'Neill, who uh, many of us in the lean community first learned about because of his role at Alcoa and the right. way that he was written about in the High Velocity Edge, um, he had three questions. They used, they're sometimes referred to as Paul's three questions or sometimes the, the three R's. And, and Paul did a fantastic job of, of enabling and ennobling people in the pursuit of, of perfection, what, what he called um, operational excellence. And the first one was, can people say every day that they had the respect of everyone in their organization, no matter what their position in the organization. So the first R is respect. Do people routinely feel respected from everybody that they're working with? The second question is, do I have the resources to be successful in completing my job? And those resources, it could be people, it could be software, it could be training and development, whatever it is that people might need. And the third one is, every day am I recognized by somebody that I care about for the contribution I'm making to our progress as an organization? And so in some ways, you know, we've, we've spent the last 20 years focused on, on the process, if you will, and the commercial structures. We've talked a lot about this idea of respect for people. Um, but I think that's where we really need to sort of pivot and make sure that we're focusing if we're gonna to continue to attract the kinds of folks we need in the construction industry, retain those folks that clearly are, are in our industry and, and, and uh, excited about what the future might hold. Um, and in essence, to find a way to return joy, not just to the contractors, not just to the trade partners, not just to the architects, but collectively as an industry, how do we uh, recreate this sense of joy within the industry? And it's there to be found, obviously, because what we do is 
is remarkable. I mean, it's 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 been such a it's it's been such a motivator for me to be part of such a community where we've had some small part in actually getting people to think about the way that they do the built environment. That's pretty phenomenal. If you look back on your life and you say, wow, that's been that's been that's been really rewarding. As has this, my friend. It's been really great spending uh, an hour and some change with you. Thanks for dropping in. Uh, we're gonna have to we'll we'll have to reprise this um maybe next year and kind of see where you are, where you are in the journey to bring joy back to to what we do. Cause I'm a pretty happy guy myself. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this community and uh, and and being able to instill some joy around the world. So thanks. It's been a great much. journey. I love it. It's been great. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, have care. a great holiday season. And uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you around the bend. All right. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Will. Thank you for tuning in to the Lean Construction Blogs podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please help us spread the word by sharing, subscribing, or leaving a review on your preferred podcast listening platform. Remember to join us next time as we continue to lower the barriers to applying lean construction and help take your lean journey to the next level. And don't forget to visit the Lean Construction blog to stay up to date on our latest podcast episodes, weekly blog posts, monthly webinars, and upcoming conferences. We hope to see you on the next episode.